So now we'll take a look at some PS CAD simulations that I set up to match the example I worked through by hand. And before I get into those uh, two scenarios I went through on the worked example, let's kind of look at what the kind of like the ideal case would give us. And so what I did is I went ahead and set up a circuit where I had a source. And in this case, this corresponded to 12.47 kV line. So if I divide by square root of 3, that gives me 7.2. It's a 60 hertz source in this case. I've got the inductance of 1.65 millihenries plugged in. I've got the capacitance in here um, that I had specified for the circuit loaded in. And um, something else that I've, I've got in the model that I just put in here just to give me some flexibility for later on is I went ahead and put in just the resistance and I just set it to zero ohms. And so this is an ideal fault resistance. What I'll do in the next example is I'll put the 0.5 ohms in there. And so in, in this case, when I'm um, setting this up, what I'm doing first is I'm modeling the fault. Okay, so the way this would actually start as far as the time circuit breaker logic, you know there's two circuit breaker operations that start to open and I go ahead and I close in the circuit breaker to kind of start the simulation and get some fault current um, running, right? And then later on what I do is then I go ahead and I assume this is going to clear at 0 0.06 seconds. And so in, in, in this particular case what I'm doing when I, when I run this is I first start off by taking a look um, at what this fault current is, right? And if I go ahead and run this through, it's just going to replot everything out. So of interest in, in this case would be to start looking at this lower left-hand screen where this is the voltage versus the current. And you see what I'm, I'm doing in this particular case is I'm assuming that this fault actually starts at a, um, magnet, at a maximum value for the source voltage magnitude. Uh, and then basically what you see is you see this oscillation right here. Now, I want this to be in steady state for the sake of the simulation. So this is why I chose a case where I didn't have a lot of DC offset. Because then I didn't have to spend a lot of time waiting until that DC offset decayed. And so it's kind of, this is kind of behind my choice of... Uh, the point on wave at least for, for when the uh, fault is actually started for the first transit. Now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be modeling the uh, opening of this circuit. And so y you can see in this particular case that the circuit breaker actually opens at a, at a current zero, and if I were just going to go ahead and zoom in here, you can see indeed that there's no chopping in this particular case. That because we have this 90 degree relationship, because we just have this reactance in the circuit for the fault, we basically see that the voltage and current are 90 degrees out of phase. And so when the voltage at is at its peak magnitude again, that's when we get the current zero. And this is the time that I would have set up then for um, having the circuit breaker operate. One thing that's kind of interesting about this is the way I do this is I don't exactly time out when that current zero is going to occur. So if you go to the, the setup of the circuit breaker, what you'll see is on the configuration, it says open possible at any current. And I type in, I have no here. What this means is that there's no chopping. In other words, in the circuit breaker logic, there's something that actually checks for a zero crossing before it actually opens the circuit breaker up. So if I, if I look to see when the tripping actually occurs, uh, it actually occurs at 0 0.06 seconds. You can think about that's when maybe when the relay sends a signal to the circuit breaker. But then if you actually look to see when this crossing occurs, um, the crossing doesn't actually occur to 0 0.0626. And so all I need to do is just make sure the circuit breaker logic is set up to give me a time 
right before that current zero and then when the current zero actually occurs then PSCAT will actually open that switch up for me so I don't have to put that exact time in there I just let the the way it handles um, the zero crossing for the circuit breaker let, let, let that logic um, just uh, just operate within PSCAD. So as far as what we see in here, as far as the transit, um, what we see in here for the transit is we see two components. We see a high frequency component in this case, and we see a low frequency component. Now when we work these out by hand, we assume that the source is DC. That's not actually the case. And so we'll actually get something kind of accurate for the first couple cycles of this particular waveform right here. Um, but then as time increases, then you, you, know, you would actually see the impact of the 60 hertz source in here. But what we're really interested in looking at is what's going on as far as this, this actual peak value. So uh, what we would want to do in this case is we would, if we want to see this in detail, you know, a lot of times what I'll do is, you can zoom into this if you want to, but a lot of times what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and I'll just set up a, a second plot, um, basically plotting the same things, but I go ahead and change the time, the, the time on it. You can see that this uh, fault's occurring at about 0 0.0623, something like that. Let's see if I can get another reading here, 0 0.0626. So what I do is I just set up a second um, plot, make sure I give it enough time where we could actually see something here. Okay. And what we can do is we, we could actually see a kind of a detail of the transit. Let me go ahead and just start this plot up a little bit earlier. Yeah, and so we, what we actually would see in this case is we could actually see this voltage start at zero, and then what happens is once the fault's cleared, then it rockets up to a peak value. This case is going to a negative peak, where this negative peak's gonna correspond to two times the source voltage. Just to make sure we could see this correctly, let me change this y-axis scale so we can actually make sure we're seeing it um, a little bit more accurately. All right, and then we, we see that we've got a, a peak value that's going to correspond to, um, uh, it's, it's, it's about 20, it's pretty close to 20 kV. And so if, if I have a source voltage uh, that corresponds to 7.2 kV RMS, that's going to correspond to 10,180 volts. And then what I would expect to see across that capacitor is going to be uh, roughly two times that value. And what we see is if we just uh, looked at the very first start of the transit waveform, basically what we're seeing is we're seeing this oscillation at this very, very high frequency. But what it actually does um, in the circuit, it actually oscillates around that 60 hertz. One thing that's kind of interesting about this as well, this simulation result, is you see actually that the transit's decaying. And you would look at this circuit right here and you kind of wonder, well, where, why is that decaying? Why isn't it just kind of oscillating forever? Because what that indicates is there's some resistance in the circuit. And this resistance is not in the circuit. I mean, it's, it's just the L and the C. So where's that actually coming from? Well, it's coming from the circuit breaker model. Because if you look at the circuit breaker model, what we've done is we've actually modeled this where it has an off resistance, an open resistance of a mega ohm, and it has a closed resistance of 0 0.005. So when that's been operated open, there actually is a one mega ohm resistance with respect to ground and what that one mega ohm resistance in the circuit breaker model is doing is providing a little bit of damping and so that's actually what's causing the damping in this case um, so you know if we wanted to make this a little bit more accurate I guess what you could do is you could play around with uh, open resistance if you wanted to 
But but the reality is that really what we're interested in looking at in this case, we're just interested in looking at the first couple cycles of this high frequency transit. We just want to pick off what's the maximum stress and that's all we need. What's going to happen after 160 hertz cycle is actually kind of irrelevant. Uh, any kind of damage that would be done would have been done the first couple cycles of that high frequency transit. Okay, so another case we could take a look at, which would be what would happen if we have a fault resistance. And as I mentioned before, what this is going to do is um, going to change the relationship between the fault voltage and current. And so what this means as far as point of wave, that the current zero is not going to occur at a peak source voltage anymore. It's going to occur at a lesser value. And so if we go ahead and run the simulation through, this time we have a fault resistance in the circuit. Takes a little while to run because I've got some pretty small time steps in here so we can get accurate results. And I'll post these results up on the, I'll post these simulations up on the Moodle site where you can run them. You can see we, first of all, that we have a different phase relationship between the fault current and the voltage. All right. We kind of do the same trick here is we just make sure that when we provide the circuit breaker open command that we make sure this time is going to be ahead of the current zero. And then what you see is you basically can see here that um, this voltage still oscillates. But in this particular case when we're looking at this what we're going to see is instead of going up to minus 20 kV, it's only getting up to a smaller value. Uh, in this case, you know, about minus 15. It shows up here as like minus 15.6. When we did the example by hand, we got minus 15.9. And keep in mind is we're not simulating all the values in here. There's a little bit of damping that's due to the circuit breaker model, but it's actually pretty close to what we got doing this by hand. And then finally, if you were going to look at the case where you add the resistance in the source model, then what we have is we, we put some additional resistance in the source model here. Uh, everything else is going to remain the same. And then when I execute this, Again, it takes a little while to run. Still more phase shift um, in terms of the relationship between the voltage and the current. Using the same timing factor on opening the circuit breaker up, um, basically we can see here that it would occur um, at a current zero still. And then if we want to look at the results on here, let me go ahead and change the scaling a little bit. Yeah, so anyway, what we see in this case is if we were going to zoom in, and take a look at what we get for the peak. We're getting some value, you know, on here like minus 14.3. We worked this through by hand, we got minus 14.5. So again, given that we we not really including, uh, um, we're not getting all the points in the simulation because of the time step, the fact we have a little bit of damping in the circuit breaker, you know, we're getting a little lesser value here, but again, it, it matches up pretty close. So as far as um, working these out, again, the thing I want you guys to take a look at is going to be, first of all, what's this peak stress as far as the, the absolute stress on the, on the circuit breaker? The other thing we're looking at is what's this change? What's this derivative? Um, if I take a look at this voltage and I say, oh, okay, I had this change of voltage with respect to what time, how long does it take me to get up to that? 
that gives me a DVDT value, this rate of rise of a recovery voltage, which also factors into insulation stress as well. So if we have a really super high transit ringing frequency, then that's going to put additional stress on this on the circuit breaker. Um, one other thing you could do, um, I guess I could call this a stupid PS CAD trick, but let's suppose you don't like these plots, and you and you're or you're trying to do some processing of this information, and you're trying to get this into another type of a program. How can you do something like this? And so what you could do if you were going to go ahead and right click on here is you can copy data to clipboard. In this case, let's just go ahead and select all the data. All right. So this is copying the data in this plot uh, to the clipboard. Um, what, what's going on right here is basically it's, it's putting this in memory. And what you could do next is you could actually cut and paste into say like a spreadsheet so if I were going to go in here to my Microsoft Office tools I've opened up Excel and I'll just drag and drop <clears throat> Excel over then what you could do if you go to home what you could do is you could um, paste these values in and you're going to do a paste special and you want to paste a CSV because when I got copied into the clipboard and put a comma in there. And so you go ahead and you paste this as a CSV. So a lot of data points in here. And voila, basically what you've got is you've got time, you've got the fault current, you've got the source voltage. And if you want to go ahead and then do this plotting in Excel, well, then you can do this plotting in Excel. Or what you could do is once you have this into a different format, like you can put this into a flat file, an ASCII file, then you can get it like into MATLAB, and then you can do some signal processing with it. So anyway, um, as I kind of go through these different PSCAD simulations, I'll kind of try to give you guys some hints on some other things you can do with PSCAD as well. All right, thank you.